He won an Emmy as the most outstanding personality on television and had an estimated audience of over 30 million people every week. 30 years after his death, we'll discuss his spiritual legacy tonight on EWTN Live, so please stay with us. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packer and welcome to EWTN Live. Our chance to bring you all sorts of guests from all over the world. And we have a great guest tonight, a good friend. But uh, before we get to him, I want to mention that today is the feast of St. Philip Neri, who was born in 1515 and died in 1595. That's a good long time in those days. And it wasn't too long before he was canonized by Pope Gregory the 15th in 1622. <clears throat> Now, as great as he is, I'm going to wait to tell you about his life because my guest and I have something both to say about St. Philip Neri. Our guest, of course, is a noted church historian and the author of a new book entitled The Spiritual Legacy of Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. And he's here this week at the network taping a series by the same name. So please welcome my friend and a friend of all of you, Father Charles Connor. Father, Father, thank you. It's delighted to be here. I, I have to first of all begin and simply say, long time no sheen. <laughs> oh, you know. Now, he used to begin his programs with that at the end of every season. So I, I had is to remember this. Right? Oh, yes. Espe well, so especially this after he'd been off the air for a few months. Long time no sheen. <laughs> Dramatic as he was, you know. And great man as he was. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a couple things though, before we get to him, let's talk a little bit about St. Philip Neri. You know, this was, uh, he's an interesting uh, saint because the, the church was going through a lot of difficulties. That's right. So the, the time, time of the he Reformation. lived in makes him even more interesting. Oh, sure. And there had been uh, throughout the uh, 15th century and well into the 16th, uh, a strong uh, tradition in Italy of sodalities and con mm -hmm. fraternities mm -hmm. and so on. What is it that St. Philip Neri did? Well, don't forget, too, this was the, the period of the Reformation. Right. And, and the faith was so weak. You know, you, you, think, of the, you think of people like Charles Borromeo uh, looking out over that vast archdiocese of Milan and weeping uh, because the faith was so weak. Priests were living so immorally. They, they hadn't gone to confession in years. They hadn't heard confession. The faith wasn't being taught. As people weren't fact, being catechized. One, one of the priests even shot him in the back during benediction. Absolutely. That's not moral. Indeed, it isn't. It's far from it. <laughs> That's right. And you know, uh, I mean, uh, uh, what the problem was that we needed uh, at that time uh, a very strong moral revolution. What we got was a theological revolution that we did not need. Right. And that's where Christianity w was divided, of course. So, of course, what makes Philip so unique is his, is his holiness. We needed holy men in the right. 16th century. And uh, his, his foundation of the Congregation of the Oratory, you know, gathering these priests together, living in communal life, and going out to their various apostolates. John Henry Newman, of course, belonged to that same oratory that right. Philip, Philip founded. But, I mean, he was, he was an eminently practical man and a man with a tremendous spirit. I, I always remember Father George Rutler telling a story about him. He said that Neary would carry the scriptures in one pocket and a book of jokes in the other pocket. I know it. You know, I, I love and, the guy. But I'll He's tell you a personal story jokes. about him. And, uh, and, and, and what I like about this gives me hope. He, oh, we'll sure. Heaven. <laughs> Absolutely. Indeed. He had a lighthearted spirit. Not that he took life or his situation lightly, but he was light of spirit. He was right. such a man of hope. One thing, he, he's uh, buried, I'm sure you've probably visited his tomb, in the Chiesa Nuova on the Corso in Rome. Mm -hmm. This is the Chiesa Nuova means the new church. Now it's, 
it was built in the 16th century, so I mean, it's not exactly new any longer, but they still call it the Chiesa Nuova. And we would, it was a ritual when we were seminarians in Rome, you know, you'd always go in and visit Philip's tomb on his feast day, and usually stay for the principal mass in the evening. But I always, always prayed at his tomb with a great deal of trepidation, because it's late May now, when we were celebrating his feast, and we all knew, all of us student seminarians who were going in there, that within no more than a week or eight days, maybe, we'd be starting final exams. So we always had a very, a very scary feeling about us getting that close to exams. And I always remember praying for Philip's inter- intercession. Now, you never had difficulty with final exams. You never worried in your life about them. Uh, but I worried that's plenty. That's not true. Father did not have to worry. <laughs> that but there, wasn't there are some true. of us who really are in fear and trembling of these things. And at the Gregorian <laughs> University, you, walk, you had to walk in, and you walked over what was called the Bridge of Sighs. And you walked over the Bridge of Sighs, and there were these professors in their rooms all ready to hit you with their exams. You know? Well, there were Jesuits. Oh, the, and of course, you know what happened at the end when, when a person finished the three-year cycle there, you finished your STB, you went out the door of the Gregorian and over to the Dodici Apostoli. In the Dodici Apostoli is buried Pope Clement the Thirteenth. He was the Pope who suppressed, suppressed the Jesuits. The Jesuits right. So when, we got, when you got your degree from the Jesuit University, you took this big bouquet of flowers and put it right at the tomb of, pope, of the Pope who suppressed the Jesuits. Now you can read anything into that you want. I, I'm telling that to an eminent Jesuit tonight. And, uh, <laughs> it's one of those things where we often pray for the salvation of his soul. Because he, he, he really tried to be a good man, but he just... Yes, indeed time. he does, sure. Yeah. sure. Well, we also want to talk about Archbishop Sheen. Absolutely. You know, who, like uh, Philip Neri, we, we hope will become canonized. And, uh, Father, even before we talk about him, uh, I should let you know and let our television audience know that we have two very wonderful people who made the trip right from the Illinois prairie where Sheen was born and raised. Uh, Paul Funson and Karen Fulty, who was the curator of the Archbishop Fulton Sheen Museum in his native town of El Paso. Now they're hiding El Paso, over Illinois. There. Hmm? El Paso, Illinois. El Paso, Illinois. Not, yes, Texas. not Texas, but El Paso, Illinois. Uh, but they're hiding over there behind the lights so they can't be seen. Maybe we can focus on them at some point. But uh, Karen, and uh, with the help of Paul, brought an enormous amount of memorabilia pertaining to Sheen that we were able to, uh, to show to our audience, the audience who will look at these broadcasts. Let, and some of the things we have with us tonight, now she brought many, many more, uh, but... Uh, one, one of the things that we have here uh, is, Boy, you look all, wonderful is, wearing a pectoral cross, I must say. <laughs> you, you were made for it, Father. No, I don't think so. I took a bow <laughs> against it. But, <laughs> but the, uh, uh, the, the pectoral cross is what a bishop wears. Over around his, his, yeah, right. around his, his neck. neck. Uh-huh. And also a, the ring. Oh, dear, dear, dear. There goes the ring. <laughs> See, and that's why I shouldn't have one. Oh, but I'll, I'll pick that up in a second. But, the, but uh, these, this is his uh, signs this was of being a, a bishop. A, cro- a pectoral cross that he wore at some time in his career. And that ring that's now under the table there. So I'll get. Uh, I'll get. I, I was, you know, I come from northeastern Pennsylvania, and I was showing it this afternoon. Uh, uh, Karen and Paul and I did an interview program to conclude the series. And I said, if you came from northeastern Pennsylvania and you looked at the ring, you, you, would, you would think that it was made of anthracite coal. That's what built a lot of northeastern Pennsylvania. And many things are manufactured from anthracite coal. Very nice statues of the Blessed Mother and all this kind of thing. But I was informed that is anything but anthracite coal. That is black onyx on that ring. I don't know when he would have worn it. They, they wore a much more simple ring after the Vatican Council. Right. Remember those? And I, I've seen many pictures of him wearing that. But, so this would have been in his early years as a bishop. But one of the things about this is it has a nice little uh, uh, image of the Blessed Mother on there. Image of the Blessed Mother as queen. And that was certainly a big theme of his life. Is the, the you know his relationship and love of the Blessed Mother? Oh, was his Episcopal motto, important. you know, that I may come to Thee through Thy Mother. Yeah, that was that was uh, fundamental to him. Uh, we we in fact we we showed uh, Karen brought a picture of the original Church of Saint Mary in El Paso, Illinois, uh, where he was baptized. Not not standing any longer. The side altar of the Blessed Mother, where his. Uh, his own mother put him on that altar following his baptism, you know, and consecrated him <laughs> to the Blessed Mother. Uh, he took a vow uh, when he was ordained that he would read Mass in her honor every Saturday for the protection of his priesthood. And uh, he never ceased to preach about her. His, probably his, one of his, the most wonderful books that he wrote in his career was titled The World's First Love. Yes. You know, and a magnificent uh, treatise on our Blessed Mother. And uh, so, yes, he, he had great, great devotion uh, to her himself. He 
Oh, he must have made at least 30 pilgrimages to Lourdes in the course of his life and probably about 10 or so to Fatima, I think. Uh, and uh, never missed an opportunity. Do you remember when he would be reciting the poem, Lovely Lady Dressed yes, in Blue, yes. Teach Me How to Pray? And he said it, many of you remember that too, don't you? I'm sure Mary Dixon Thayer's poem. And, and of course he had such drama and theatrical ability when he'd be reciting it, you know. Uh, but uh, yes, he, it was, it was, she, she really formed a very important component of his, of his spirituality. And so we've, we've devoted a few of the programs, of course, to his treatment of our Blessed Mother and her, most particularly her intercessory role. He stressed that so greatly, I think. And before we get to that, I just also want to mention that uh, you also have one, uh, his chalice. His cha now, I should tell you, too, both the chalice and the pectoral cross are on loan from the Fulton Sheen Foundation in Peoria, Illinois. The, uh, the ring, however, is the possession of the Fulton Sheen Museum in El Paso, Illinois. So they're, they're two different entities entirely, you know. And as I say, Karen, who is with us, is the curator. And this is the second year Karen has made the trip here from Illinois and brought all kinds of very, very fine memorabilia of Archbishop Sheen so that we could share it with the, uh, with the television audience. And of course, if anybody gets over to El Paso, Illinois, they should go to the museum. Oh, by all means, yeah. by all means. El Paso, uh, we were talking about this this afternoon, El Paso has not changed a great deal. Sheen was born there in 1895, and he probably would recognize most of the buildings on Main Street if he were, if he were to walk down Main Street When today. a place is that good, what's to change? What's to change? What's to change? That's right. There is a marker in front of what had originally been Sheen's hardware store. He was born up on the second floor over his father's hardware store. Uh, the building itself is not there, but, uh, but there's at least a commemorative marker. So he's, he's much, much remembered, and certainly the Diocese of Peoria is so much involved in his canonization process. Yes, they are. The, yes, they are. the postulator in Rome is a Peoria priest. And of course, Father Andrew Apostoli is the vice postulator, you know, so he's... Well, you know, one, there's one of the things that's very important about Sh Archbishop Sheen is while he was still a Monsignor, he was one of the first Catholics on the radio, and he was the first television evangelist. Indeed he was. Oh, you know, yeah. uh, so talk a little bit about his radio and, and television uh, careers. Well, he began, uh, he began in the 1930s actually. He, he went to Catholic University of America uh, in 1925 as a professor of philosophy. Uh, taught in Caldwell Hall there, had most of his courses. And he was there from 1925 to 1950. He went to New York in 1950 to become the national director of the Propagation of the Faith. So he would have begun radio broadcasts about uh, either 1930 or 1931. Right, right. Uh, the, the Catholic Hour was sponsored by the National Council of Catholic Men based in Washington, of course, and he became, he, he was not the only speaker on the radio broadcast, but he was a very regular speaker and, and uh, you know, certainly a, one of the featured speakers. And oftentimes, uh, for example, a year's broadcast would be on one theme, and at the end of the theme, or at the end of the year, rather, that theme would be put into a book. So when you say he's written 60-some books, many of those books were either a year of lectures at Catholic University or a year of radio broadcasts uh, on, the, on the Catholic Hour, you know. And then, of course, uh, uh, as, as radio, the 30s and 40s, he would have been on radio, uh, as well as giving convert instruction classes, Father. You know, he would, he would make the train trip from Washington, D.C. to New York almost every weekend. And he'd either go, they have them in St. Patrick's Cathedral, and they also had them in, uh, oh dear, the Paulist Church there in Columbus Circle, St. Paul the Apostle. Uh, and either one of those two locales, he would, he would conduct convert classes of, of large numbers, you know. Uh, and back then on Sunday afternoon to begin his, his classes on Monday morning in Washington. So this went on for years and years, and he was giving the radio broadcast at the same time. Uh, in the, uh, as a bishop, of course, he, he was consecrated a bishop in 1951. And as a bishop, he... Uh, 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 was certainly one of the early pioneers on television, beginning with the, on the Dumont Television Network and then going national on ABC. Archbishop Dolan in the foreword here makes an interesting comment. He said, he talks about people like Ed Sullivan and Milton Berle and these personalities of the 50s. He said, they're frozen in time. I mean, if you think about these people, you think about the era in which, the right. years in which they were, but they're gone. Right. And people just maybe bring out their reruns for nostalgia on, on occasion and not that sure. often really. 
Fulton Sheen is not frozen in time, uh, far, far from it. And, and, and there's a tremendous resurgence today, which I find very interesting uh, in, the, uh, in the spiritual message that he had to convey, all the various themes and component parts. Because of course his message is timeless, you know. And it's, it, uh, one, one of the <clears throat> things about him, the reason it was timeless was because he did focus so much on teaching the faith. Positively, and indeed he did. A love of Christ, his blessed mother, and the church was the, 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 the dominating themes of his mm -hmm. life. That's right. And it came out in his teaching. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, I, I certainly have listened to his priest's retreats a number of times, I mean, I don't know how many times, oh, yeah. his uh, instructions to, uh, converts. for converts, uh -huh. that's on, on, uh, on tape. CD and, and CD tape. now, yes. Um, you know, uh, it, a, a lot, matter of fact, uh, St. Joseph Communication mm -hmm. makes those available. Absolutely. Um, and uh, it's uh, just wonderful material. Mm -hmm. And of course, the old programs that we run here at the network too. Exactly. You know, the, the television exactly. programs, they're, exactly. they're on continually. Now, one of the things, though, uh, I'd like you to talk about, because I know it's part of the series in your book, this is the year for priests. Mm -hmm. And the, I already mentioned how uh, li I listened often to his retreats for priests, especially when I was in graduate school. Mm -hmm. It was very helpful for me because in grad school, as you know, I mean, you were finishing up a degree at the John at the Paul, John Paul Center. Institute in Washington. And you know, it's you can get so into this heady, uh, very specific oh. uh, kind of material, you and <laughs> you know, it's very dry. Mm -hmm. He was a nur spiritual nourishment for me in that period of going through graduate school. Mm -hmm. Not now, wonderful, yeah. What would be some of the highlights of his reflection on the priesthood? Uh, you, you had mentioned earlier that there was a, certainly there was a tie-in between the priesthood and the Blessed Mother. And I recall a, a little note that he wrote on a sheet of notepaper to everyone who uh, uh, congratulated him on the 60th anniversary of his ordination of the priesthood. He wrote and he said, the, the priesthood is eternal as is Christ, the eternal high priest. Uh, I am privileged to have served 60 years of it. At the end of the road, however, the only important thing is when we meet that eternal priest that he says to us, I have heard my mother speak of you. So he does tie in the two. One of the central themes, it seems to me, is that uh, that he dwells on is a, a man is not a priest. He's a priest and a victim. This is over and over yes. and over. He, a priest is one who offers, but he's one who is offered as well. And he said, you know, one of the, see the last 10 years of his life, from 69 to 79, after he resigned his uh, diocese in Rochester, uh, he, he really said that he received an inspiration to go around giving priests retreats all over the United States. And he went to England and Ireland and English speaking countries, Canada and so forth. And, uh, uh, he said that he felt one of the, re given all of the problems that had emerged, all the confusion, and priests wanting to go off into the social apostolate and do this and do that, they had forgotten Christ. They had forgotten the source of their priesthood. They'd forgotten the source of their vocation. They'd forgotten what is to be the essence of it all. They wanted to go out and be social workers. They wanted to go out and be involved in the political order and all this. And, and he said, we're not presenting the priesthood correctly uh, as it should be presented to young men. If, if the sacrificial element of the priesthood is presented, he said about 1971 or 72, he was certain that we would get more vocations. He said, you know, the priesthood had lost its way in the 60s and in the 70s, and he wanted to try to bring it back, and he did that, uh, he did that through these, these marvelous, but, but certainly it, it's priesthood, but it's also victimhood. You know, there's, there's no such thing as a six o'clock mass, he said, uh, the, the mass that we say permeates our entire day. And the, the overflow, the effect of the Mass is when we bury the dead, when we visit the sick, when we teach classes, when we do convert instructions. He said even when we have almsgiving for the propagation of the faith. <laughs> so that was, that was vintage sheen. So in other words, uh, that it permeated every aspect, every moment of a priest's life. But a priest was also, also a victim uh, because Jesus Christ, the eternal high priest, uh, offered and was offered. He was a priest victim. Uh, you know, not just a priest on the cross. And every priest who has that same configuration is also a victim. Well, if he, if he reiterated that theme once, he reiterated it hundreds and hundreds and yes. hundreds of times. It seems like he couldn't say that enough. He so would, if there was a central theme to his, to his preaching on the priesthood, that had to be it. 
He, he, he would decry this whole issue that came from the late 60s about a, a crisis of priestly identity. Oh, indeed. He, he would just go, you know, go, you know ballistic. Oh, sure, sure. Had, a priest doesn't know his identity. His identity is in Christ. That's true. And he would Ab just be Ab really strong on that. Indeed he uh, was. But it was yeah. the time when, uh, the, the because you were in seminary too about that same period, and there was talk about the hyphenated priest. Mm -hmm. You know, as you mentioned, social worker, teacher, mm -hmm. all that. Mm -hmm. But he emphasized the, the priestly identity in Christ as priest and victim. That's right. He didn't, he didn't want to minimize by any means the good that, had, uh, uh, that uh, could be done in the world. In fact, he said, he said that uh, um, at, w uh, at one point in time, the emphasis in spirituality was being holier than thou. And he said, we went from being holier than thou to being worldlier than thou. You know, and he drew the comparison. Uh, it was an interesting story. This, oh, this is, my goodness, it's years now since I heard this one, so it's kind of vague up there. But he, he uh, used the contrast uh, of the various coronations of the popes. Benedict XV and Pius XI had been, had been um, Pius XI, I think, had been crowned right under the uh, main altar of St. Peter's, under, right uh, in the Bernini columns. Uh, Pius XII moved down the aisle a bit into the nave. John XXIII, he said, with those great arms of his, like the carnal columns of Bernini, uh, came right out into the world and was crowned in the piazza of St. Peter's. And he used that as an example of how the church had indeed been withdrawn and had to go out into the world. But in the going out into the world, we cannot lose the essence of who we are. We cannot lose the essence of what a priest is an altar Christus, another Christ, and so and forth. One of the things that he also would bring up for the priest and for the whole congregation is the, the three parts of the Eucharist uh, the, the, oh, the, yes, the, the drama and three acts. Yes. Right. You know, it's an interesting thing about that, too, Father, because if you, if you look at the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy of the Vatican Council, Sacrosanctum Concilium, uh, and I, I certainly don't want to say that the theology of the Mass was changed, no, but there was a renewed emphasis uh, on the Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist. And this is what we have been, this is what we've been raised with now for a number of decades. He never, he never uh, left that theme of the Mass being a drama in three acts, the offertory, the consecration, and the communion. And then he would develop each one of those theologically. And he said it was this, this great drama, you know, which all stems back to the crucifix, to the cross, of course, was not to be left to the chance recollection of men. And so he, he, said it was, he said it was very much like road shows, taking a play on the road. And the play would be reinvigorated, reenacted, if you will, everywhere in the world. But, but I, should, I, I thought you were going to, when you asked me that, uh, as, as regards priestly spirituality, and this, this we have to bring in, in any discussion on the priesthood with Sheen, one daily continuous hour in the presence of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament is what he recommended to all priests. Now he said you can, the only thing that would interrupt it would be the Mass. You could do 30 minutes before, 30 minutes after. And he said for lay people, at least 30 minutes a day, because it takes the first 15 of those 30 minutes to remove all of the noonday devils. He called them all the temptations that keep pulling us terribly weak human beings down, you know. And God knows we're all terribly weak human beings, every one of us. So he, re he said, I know all the devotions, all the exercises, all the Catholic practices. The only thing that worked was coming into the presence of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. And he said, uh, especially to priests, he said, the longer you do this, you cannot keep coming into the Lord's presence day after day without either a copy of the scriptures or some good scriptural commentary. Uh, and, and curiously enough, do you know the commentary that he recommended? Yeah, it was the one by the Scottish uh, Barclay. Protestant Barclay. William, William Barclay, the Daily Study uh, Bible, which you, can, which you can still get in Catholic books. Or, and he said, uh, he was interested, he said, now Barclay is a believer and he knows many, many languages. He's not a Catholic. And you will find many things in the scriptural commentary that a Catholic cannot agree with. They're just theologically wrong from a Catholic perspective. But he said that was a very, very small price to pay, first of all, with the overall good of the scriptural meditation that one could get from Barclay, and also contrasted with, again, he was talking now in the early 70s, contrasted with uh, many of the theologians writing in the early 70s right. who were dissenting from church teaching. Right. Far, far worse than anything you'd read in Barclay. He said many of these books, you know, of our contemporary theologians, you open the pages and ink drips out. They're all alike. You know, you read one, you've read them all. Curiously, he made that point back in about 1930 
1931. He said, to read the, the works of a modern progressive thinker today, if you've read one, you've read them all. <laughs> Well, the, the, the other thing that I was going to bring up about, uh, uh, as trying to allude to a, a, a regard to Mass, is how he would see the liturgy of the Eucharist with the offertory, consecration, and uh, communion mm -hmm. as three parts where the, the victimhood mm -hmm. of the priest and of the congregation would be as the offertory is the offering of the human, the human gift of bread and wine. The and that we put, bread and, the grain and, and the grain that's where we it. offer ourselves up. I offer ourselves, absolutely. And then at the consecration, that is the moment of the, the, where we celebrate Christ's death. Mm, right, that's that, right. The, the separation of the body and the blood wow. in the consecration symbolizes death. The separation of his blood from his, yeah. But that gift that we've offered is what Christ transforms into his transforms. moment of death. So that yeah, we're... It's a recuperation, really. Yeah, we mm -hmm. join, we're united by Christ at Mass in Absolutely. that suffering. And then communion, especially, and, and this is my own reflection, but when we fracture the host and put a particle into the chalice, that's a sign of the resurrection. Resurrection Sign. and the lifting up of it. Mm -hmm. That receiving. That's not just your own. He says the same thing. Oh, the, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I hadn't Absolutely. Heard him, I hadn't heard him say that, but it was certainly the that. coming back in your mind. That's oh, uh, yes, he, that's him. He uh, saw this as the resurrection, so that mm -hmm. the the death never stops. It always moves toward the resurrection. Absolutely. Yeah. And that this process is where that victimhood. And priestly ministry mm -hmm. is is lived out at the same time, lived out and that's a, a, mm -hmm. that's true for every Catholic mm -hmm. who comes to Holy Mass. Everyone, and that's why he said, you know, writing in the era he did the communion rail. He was going back to the period many of us remember when remember when we would kneel to receive Holy Communion at the communion rail, huh? uh, and it's the most democratic place in the world, because of course everyone is recuperating the same thing that they have offered in sacrifice, right. Right. you know. Prince Pauper, everyone's the same at the communion rail. And well, to think this is the chalice the precious blood was, that he consecrated was in. Isn't that something? Yes. So we're honored to have it with us tonight on loan. Yeah, one of his other great lines about the consecration is that when the priest is consecrating the host or the, the wine in the chalice, mm -hmm. it's, he says it's as if God the Father looks at him through Jesus colored glasses. Yes, yes, yes. He sees Christ in the priest and this is why we should not have an identity crisis. Mm -hmm. God the Father wants to see Christ in us. He was so, you know, the way he could capture something. Remember he was remember when he would talk about uh, a priest giving absolution. Uh, and, and he said, you know, a priest would raise his hand in absolution and 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 figuratively speaking, the the blood of Christ was dripping from his fingers as he was absolving. You know, he just had such a uh, you know, it was poetic, it was dramatic, but my heavens, he was saying something. And he we really remembered was saying it. something. We, we can remember and we, those we things. remember it. It's, these things are so they're almost indelible exactly. because he was so profound in the way he uh, in the way he uh, spoke and and the material he had to present. Uh, no question uh, about it. Now this has been a, a tremendous thing. And th the other thing too about him, though, is he was on TV, as we said earlier, and he, sp but he spoke to the whole nation. He, oh, he His did viewers indeed. were not only Catholic. Oh, no, far from it. Far. No, he was, he commanded respect from everyone, from non-Catholics, Jews, uh, you know, Christians of other denominations and so forth. I mean, uh, Billy Graham was, was certainly a good friend and, uh, you know, and uh, even a man like Norman Vincent Peale, who would have been in a somewhat different category than Graham, certainly in his early days. Uh, nonetheless, in later years, Peale invited Archbishop Sheen to come and speak in the Marble Collegiate Church in New York City. Yeah. He, he would give the Lenten noonday sir exercises in the famous uh, St. Bartholomew's on Park Avenue, right next to the Waldorf Astoria there, yeah. you know. He gave the Lenten, Lenten discourses there. So he, no, he commanded the respect of, uh, of a very, very broad spectrum of the United States, I think. Yeah. And, and he made Catholics very, very proud to be Catholics because he, he represented the Catholic priesthood in such a, such a wonderful way. Another thing about, uh, about his career was uh, that um, when you think of the uh, majority of years of his priesthood, decades of his priesthood. It was the great era of faith, 
uh, when the faith was very, very strong in this country, you know. Uh, he, he was getting to be an older man uh, in, uh, in the post-conciliar years and, and obviously came from the world in which he came and had, I think, a lot of sorrow to see what was going on. I, I was giving a talk on him in Washington not long ago and a priest asked a question, a very, very interesting question uh, that it's worth bringing up here, I think. The priest said, why do you think it was that he did not play a greater role at the Second Vatican Council. You know, he only made one intervention in the entire four sessions of the Vatican Council, and that had to do was not long after he made a famous documentary called, you may remember the movie, The 30th Parallel. It was made when he was director of the propagation of the faith, and he said if you, if you took the globe and at the 30th parallel of latitude uh, kind of circumnavigated the globe, uh, all of the wealth and affluence of society would be found north of the 30th parallel, and then the poverty would be, you know, would be south of it. And he made an intervention uh, regarding the emphasis that the church should place uh, on the poor of the world and poverty, which of course sprang naturally from his years as national director at the propagation of the faith. But it is interesting, isn't it, that he, uh, that he uh, would not have intervened I know, in more he was areas. A great, good philosopher and, and good theologian, he, yes, but yes. he uh, let others do that. Well, we, one thing we have to do uh, is take a break. So we'll come back in a couple of minutes because we want to get some of your questions and your comments, and we'll try to get in a couple uh, clips of Archbishop Sheen's TV show. So please stay with us. Thank you. Welcome back. Uh, first of all, I want to let you know that EWTN has a free weekly e-newsletter. It's called Wings. You can go to www.ewtn.com and register to get the latest news and information on what EWTN has to offer. It lets you know programming, all sorts of other good stuff. So that's free. It doesn't cost you a penny. Second, uh, on, on the Internet. Secondly, uh, we have... a couple of nice groups, one group from Florida, one group from uh, Louisiana, and a few individuals here. We'd love to have you come and join us if you can as well. If you can't, contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966. That's 205-271-2966, or go to our website, www.ewtn.com. And some of the Floridians had fried green tomatoes, right? Is that good? <laughs> Yeah, there's the lot enjoyed that. So uh, you come on down here and enjoy yourself with the programs. Come join us at Mass and visit the local places as well. You ready for some questions? Sure. Let's start off with a call. We have Samantha on the line. Hello, Samantha. Hi, Father Mitch. Hi, where are you from? I'm from Pennsylvania. Great. And what is your question? Well, my sister Sarah and I would like to ask Father Connor if Bishop Sheen has had um, any influence in your vocation, Father? <laughs> well, I happen to know the callers there, too. Uh, is yeah, this just, a setup? It's a setup. I didn't know they were going to be calling, however. <laughs> That's great. Did he have an influence in my vocation? Yes, indeed, he did. Uh, and I think from a very, very early age, as I think he influenced a lot of, uh, a lot of people, a lot of priests in yeah. their vocation as well. And uh, there was something about the... Oh, just uh, his, his presence and his message. And uh, I, can, I can remember being in high school and just reading one book after another after another. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I can remember, uh, now you're much too young for this, but I go back to the days of black and white television. And I mean, <laughs> boy, oh boy. It was Wait either, a minute, I'm older than you are. Oh, it was either. The, <laughs> they the, were just trying to get that out of The me. July 27th <laughs> club is in session here. But in any... <laughs> 
<laughs> in any event, it was, you remember, it was Bishop Sheen Absolutely. and President Eisenhower. Right. Boy, when those two were on, that was, that was America of the 50s, wasn't it? Well, and, it, and, it uh, was. And, uh, though but I, yes, he did, he did certainly influence my vocation. There's no question about that. I do have to admit that I was sort of um, uh, disappointed at times. My mother and father wanted to watch Bishop Sheen instead of Uncle Milton Berle. Oh. But they made the better choice by yeah. far. <laughs> As and his, his ratings were higher than Burl's. Uh, remember the line that he said about that when he met Burl? Well, well, Uncle Fulty and Uncle Milty, but I don't know. Well, well, well he, one time I, they I'll met. I'll tell you, I, I met Burl once in Hollywood years did ago, you? and he really praised Fulton Sheen to the skies. He really did. Well, S they, they were teasing at a Blackfriars dinner, mm -hmm. and uh, Milton Burl said to him, how did you do it? I was number one. I was oh, Mr. Television. Is this the writer? And, and he yeah, said yeah. to, uh, Bishop Sheen said to Milton Burl, well, it was easy. I had better writers than you. Mar to Mark Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke, and John. <laughs> I'd forgotten that, but I did hear it, though. Yeah. We have uh, another mm -hmm. questioner here from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? I'm from Tampa, Florida. Tampa, Florida. Mm -hmm. Good to have you here. And what is your question? Well, in t television a lot today, Catholics and Christians aren't always seen in a good light. And I'm, I was just wondering if uh, when he was on, if he had any opponents or people who didn't like him being so popular tried to hinder him? Ah, good question. Very good question. I, I think, um, not, not that I'm aware of, uh, not that I've ever heard of. You know, it was, first of all, it was, um, it was an era in the United States when, when religious faith in general was much, much stronger than it is today. And, and was also seen in a more positive light in the media. Much, much more positive light seen in that. That's a very good point, too. Uh, today, of course, the Catholic Church would come under such criticism and such, we're under such uh, barrage all the time because of the scandals, because of the dissent, because of the massive exodus out of decades ago. Uh, none of that existed in the 1950s. Now, they're probably, in, in a lot of ways, because, because religion was strong, between, because Catholicism was strong, Protestantism was strong, and so forth, um, there would have been, I would say, more anti-Catholic hostility still present uh, in the 1950s, or at least present, not that it is not present today, it certainly is, but present in a different way, maybe even in a stronger way. T today, if there's anything, there's indifference. In those days, there was a much sharper line of demarcation. But even given that, uh, with, the, with the, the respect that this man commanded in the United States uh, across the board, uh, I certainly was never aware of any criticism directed at him personally or any anti-Catholic bigotry uh, that was thrown at you. Know, it would be awfully hard. Uh, there would be some Catholic spokesman of that time that, that could have invited criticism, I think. But he would not have been one of them. No, and, and he, he did tell a story of how he would go throughout the South uh, doing street corner preaching. Mm. And he was here in Alabama was here once. In Alabama. And the Catholic what, Evidence Guild. Exactly. Questions, what was, it, what was the sign thing on the sign? Questions uh, pleasantly answered. Yes. Like and, and he's there in his regalia on the back of a train. Right. And he would, uh, one well, time. Questions I, cheerfully answered. That's it, cheerfully, cheerfully answered. answered. And one of the uh, hecklers in the crowd said, how did Jonah yeah. get into that whale? <laughs> And he said, well, I don't know. When I go to heaven, I want to ask Jonah. The first thing I'll do. Yeah. And he said, well, what if Jonah's not in heaven? <laughs> and Bishop Sheet said, all right, then you ask him. <laughs> that was a classic line, indeed. <laughs> Let's uh, go to, as a matter of fact, we got a clip of uh, Archbishop Sheet. Let's go to a clip right now. Friends. We're always very happy to hear from mothers about their children and their reactions of children to our program. One story came to us this week from Denver. It seems that this child, under four years of age, was a bit impatient about being served his breakfast. And uh, he was banging his spoon on his bowl, demanding service. The mother was occupied and unable to do it. Finally picked up the bowl pulled it over his head and says, look, Mom, Bishop Sheen. <laughs> uh, let's go over to another call. We have Frank on the line. Hello, Frank. Hi, good evening, Father Connor. Where are you from, Frank? 
Hi, good, e good evening. Uh, Father Connor, I worked in your shadow at the University of Scranton and at uh, the Diocese of Scranton, uh, down the hall from our pastor, Monsignor Frank Callahan, and my, my question is in two parts. The, the first one is, essentially, what can uh, the legacy in terms of Catholic communication in the 21st century, can we learn from Bishop Sheen in this, uh, in this environment of advanced technology and Twitter, and Facebook and, and so forth, uh, how can we capitalize on this wonderful example? And secondly, you mentioned the postulators and the, the, uh, the road to canonization. What needs to be accomplished before that canonization can finally take place? Well, as far as the first part of your question, uh, Frank, uh, what, what lesson can be learned for communication today? Uh, the lesson that can be learned is be Catholic, be authentically Catholic, nothing but Catholic, and don't water down. Uh, and that is really what EWTN is all about. And I think that if, if um, Archbishop Sheen were alive today, he would be very, very happy indeed with EWTN yes. and yes. the tremendous work that goes on here. I really do because it's such a, the, the network is such a bastion of orthodoxy and it's such a, a refreshing fountain of faith, if you will, which he was in his day uh, because there was a lot more than just the Life is Worth Living television series. Uh, there was so much that he did to foster Catholicism uh, and, and to, to strengthen the faith in an era when, as I I say it was already strong, but nonetheless, just the work he did with convert instructions and, and right. so on and so right. forth, just the work he did with his writing. So I would say his lesson today would be to be as authentic, to be what you are and nothing less than what you are. Now, as regards the second, uh, his, his canonization, uh, I was at a meeting in New York in December and uh, one of the priests very much involved with it said that uh, it would be a wonderful thing within a year's time if we might be calling him venerable and he saw that as a, a unique possibility. Uh, there are some purported miracles under consideration. I really don't know what the status of those miracles are but there are, there are at least two and in fact I think I heard the other day that a third story had been presented of a, a, a proposed cure. I, I don't know, I just know that in very, very skeletal outline. And but the, the, you know, the thing with Sheen, especially that it's going to be a laborious process, it seems, is the examination of writing. Because talk about an embarrassment of riches with all the many years. You know, he, not only the books, but remember he was a syndicated columnist for years and years in the Catholic press and the secular press. And then we have all these CDs to go through, the television programs, the radio. I mean, it's just endless, endless, endless. And it has to be closely examined, uh, you know, for, for content. So... It's something that could take uh, a number of years, but... Well, one of the things, too, so folks understand is that when you talk about the miracles, for somebody to be made uh, a, a blessed, there has mm -hmm. to be a miracle recognized by the church, and mm -hmm. that doesn't include things like, well, I found a parking place on Manhattan. Oh, that no, no, good no, 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 it has to no, be... No, uh, has to be scientifically real, unexplainable. Yeah. Yes. Right, exactly. Pure, That's, uh, they, they have scientists examine... Mm -hmm before and after and look at the records and make sure that they detect that this really is an act of Which God. Which itself That's, takes years, really. Yeah, yeah. They, can't, they can't make an arbitrary quick decision yeah. uh, based on a, a good diagnosis or something of that right. sort. You know? So it's a lengthy process, but we hope and pray. We try to be careful. We have another <laughs> question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? Melbourne, Florida, Father. Great. Good to have you here. What is your question? Uh, yes, uh, you mentioned um, that he was responsible for many conversions. And I, I think I read one place that he was responsible for Claire Booth Luce. He was conversion. indeed. Mrs. Luce was one of his more famous converts, yes. And I was wondering how many other famous ones would we know? Oh, my heavens. Uh, let's see. Well, the, the, you know, the list would be pretty long, of course, uh, but uh, who would some of the better ones know? Well, some of you may remember on CBS there was a sportscaster some years ago, Haywood Hale Brune. His father, Haywood Brune would have been a convert of Bishop Sheen. Uh, another one was Louis Boudens, who was editor of the Communist Daily Worker, who actually had been a baptized Catholic, but had been brought back to the, to the practice of the faith uh, by, uh, by Fulton Sheen. Another one would be Horace Mann. Uh, Horace Mann was, was very active in the uh, anti-Al Smith movement of 1928, and he was uh, an active disseminator of anti-Catholic propaganda in the Smith-Hoover campaign. And yet, because, uh, because So folks, again, remember, Al Smith was the first Catholic, Catholic. candidate for president in the United States. Uh, nominated by a major party. Right. Not right. by a minor party, but right, by a major, by a major party. party. First one nominated by a, min a minor party, you know who his, he was? No. Charles O'Connor. I never knew you ran. <laughs> well, you knew I was alive in 1872. That's oh. what I was doing in 18... He was a New York City lawyer. 
Got several hundred thousand votes, but that's another story. Uh, who else? Fritz Kreisler would be another good example, the famous violinist who ultimately wrote the, wrote the musical score for the Life is Worth Living program. Sheen had gone to visit uh, someone uh, who he had been requested to visit, and the, the particular person was not at home. And as he was going up in the elevator, uh, he, uh, the, the fellow who was uh, the elevator operator said, did you know that Fritz Kreisler lives right across the hall from the people you are here to visit? And he said, no, no, I didn't know that. So as I said, the people were not home. He knocked on Fritz Chrysler's door and just started a conversation with him, asked him if he and his wife were interested in converting to Catholicism, and they said yes. <laughs> so there you have it. It's as simple as that. And Fritz sort of door-to-door salesman here. That, that's right. That's right. Absolutely. Who else? Henry Ford, you know, who married Ann McDonald. He would have been a Sheen convert years ago. Uh, oh, my goodness gracious. There, were, there certainly are others, and I wish they would come to me. Believe it or not, I, I devoted a chapter in a book uh, on converts I wrote some years ago, but it's a lot of years now. And he would tell stories about a lot of little people, too. There were so many folks. Mm -hmm. uh, like the, Ro he, Rosetta Lenoir was another one. She was on these soap operas in the afternoon, you know, rather famous actress. Grace Moore, the singer, the opera singer, was another one. Uh, sure. He, it, one of my favorites was of the, uh, he, he went in to have something done at a jewelry store, and the, the, the Jewish uh, jeweler, uh, said to him, these nuns sold me all the crucifixes for the silver. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with them? That's right. The, the, the Jewish guy said that oh, yeah. about the nuns. They, they're giving up the crucifix. What's wrong with them? And he said, I told them, and later on I received them in the church. Received them into the church. Absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. We have uh, another call of Father David on. Hello, Father David. Hello, Mitch. Hi, where are you from, Father? Archdiocese of Chicago. Great, and what is your question? The question is, I was wondering what kind of bishop was Bishop Sheen. His time must have been very limited. Bishops are so busy. And also, around the time post-council, with the climate and the presbyterate and all, how was uh, his relationship with his own presbyterate? You know, uh, so, with his own particular yeah. style and et cetera. Oh, well, is, this, is this Father David Simonetti? Yes. Oh, good. I didn't, I didn't get your first, your last name. It's good to see you. He's been a guest on the show before. Oh, wonderful. And well, so where was he bishop, first of all? Well, first of all, he was an auxiliary bishop of New York, uh, and he would have been in that capacity for 15 years. Mm -hmm. While he was national director of the Society for the Propagation of the Faith, he was also auxiliary bishop of New York. In 1966, at the age of 71, he became bishop of Rochester. New York. Uh, Rochester, New York, yes. And he served there for only three years. Uh, at, and when he was 74 years of, all, uh, of age, he asked Pope Paul VI to, to um, uh, accept his resignation on the 50th anniversary of his ordination, very much in mind that he wanted to give priests retreats. He had a somewhat stormy three years in yeah. Rochester. They were stormy times to begin with. They were, they were not tranquil times in the church. Uh, I I'd never really... Uh, read anywhere in his uh, in his autobiography, for example, uh, him, him say, but I, I, I would have a feeling that perhaps, perhaps diocesan administration would not have been the greatest love of his life. Remember, he was a scholar, he was a right. teacher, he was a writer and so forth, and uh, a preacher par excellence. He, he also had and, another difficulty, though. Uh, I've been over to Rochester and talked to a number of the priests, interviewed them about uh, that that situation, mm -hmm. and one of the problems, and Archbishop Sheen mentioned this in one of his books, that he would he he loved the mass in English. He wanted things to move forward on helping the poor, and he would he just ordered the pastors to contribute part of their money to this That's work true. for the poor. That's true. And, and that was misunderstood, you know. And they mm -hmm. said, well, you can't just tell us what to do. It was a time where you're supposed to listen to everybody. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he said he could not imagine a priest not doing what his bishop told him to do. Right. So he was from the mindset, you obey. Absolutely. They were from the mindset, you've got to talk to us about it. Sure. And sure. that conflict of culture of how you lead and rule mm -hmm. was, was a big part of the, the crisis that he had. Very definitely. Yeah. No question. Let's go ahead and get another question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Fitchburg, Massachusetts. Great. Yes. Good to have you here. Uh, quite a while ago, I had heard that the Pope wanted to make him a cardinal, but for some reason or other, he talked him his way out of it and didn't accept it. 
Do you know the reason why? I don't. Well, I don't. I, it's I, God knows if it went that high or not to the Pope. But uh, I remember Mike Wallace on a CBS interview one time uh, putting the question this way. Well, uh, many people wonder why Fulton Sheen did not become a cardinal. And his response was, I refuse to pay the price, which meant, of course, that there was some element of ecclesial politics that he did not want to enter into. Uh, he did not elaborate on what that was. And he really, he had much, much suffering in the church in his life uh, that is somewhat well known. Uh, but uh, in his autobiography, he refused to speak about it. Right. And he said, you know, the mystical body of Christ is never, ever, ever uh, built up uh, by, uh, by these kind of discussions. There would have been people who would have been thrilled if he would open up and just tell the whole story and so forth. But uh, uh, he was not about to do that and, and much to his credit, you know. Yeah, much yeah. Much to his credit. But he, he endured many years of suffering. There's no question about that. Let's take another call. We have Marie on the line. Hello, Marie. Hi. Hi, where are you from? Pennsylvania, Northeast Pennsylvania. Great, and what is your question? Okay, well, um, I've been watching Bishop Sheen since I was little. Uh, he always put me into a trance when I was little, and he still does. And I would just like to say that there are two episodes that really stuck in my mind. Um, one was about how he was condemning uh, war, in that over the, the years with different wars, more and more civilians get killed than the enemy. And another episode was that um, he was condemning capitalism, uh, not uh, capitalism in and of itself, but capitalism that exploits the poor. And, you know, he was, he was truly a warrior for social justice. And I think that, you know, more of our leaders need to speak out on that. And uh, uh, like Glenn Beck, he, um, he said that if your church has anything about social justice on its website, run. Well, <laughs> that is what the Catholic Church represents. The core of, of Catholicism is standing up for the underdog. You know, uh, there's this an interesting uh, story that comes to my mind in response to that as well. Uh, he was, th there are certain broadcasts, uh, as this young lady mentions, that, that indeed stand out in your mind. Yes. I remember one particular one uh, when communism was really at its height in the 1950s. Right. And, you know, he would, he would go after atheistic communism and, and the godless nature of the system and all the rest of it. But on one particular evening, he... Uh, he predicted that Stalin would indeed fall and, you know, Stalin, like every other mortal human being, was going to have to die and he was going to have to face his maker. Within about 48 hours, Stalin was dead. Uh, very, very prophetic. And people really stood up and, and took notice, you know, of that particular broadcast. And, you know, when he talked, uh, I remember one of the programs he did on that, I mean, he, uh, on these topics, uh, because he, he certainly did live through the two world wars. Mm -hmm. And he was well aware of the, 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 the horrors, uh, in, especially in World War II, mm -hmm. imposed on the citizenry. And that war was no longer between oh, yeah. armies, but there were wars of conquest in which the, the, the citizens were killed. And he, you know, warned about that as a solution. But the other thing, too, is when he talked about social justice, he was adamantly against Marxism. Mm -hmm. And social justice would never be the state controlling the means of production or distributing that's right the things of, of the, the 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 value the things of the value that would be the last thing he would ever do and that's not at all what he meant by social justice but he did talk about how important it was for businesses to make sure that they they themselves he didn't want the government to do it no. he wanted businesses Private to take enterprise, the initiative yeah. to make sure that they help build people up and paid wages that were not just bare minimum, mm -hmm. but would be a, a kind of support. So the fam he was concerned that families would be able to survive. That's right. Especially in that post-war period mm -hmm. where all the adults had grown up in the Depression. Yes. Yeah. And they didn't want hunger again. That's right. And that was a big concern of his. Indeed it was. Indeed it was.
Well, you know, I, the, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just, just saying about I, a minute or so. Yeah, I just recall another uh, uh, story that he told about uh, Eugenio Pacelli when he was papal nuncio to uh, uh, Germany mm -hmm. during the war. And, of course, there was a plot to kill him, and some communist soldiers burst into the uh, uh, to the residence. Oh, and, yes. and, yeah. you know, he, they... they Pulled, they yanked on the pectoral cross. Pacelli was right. Somehow they, for some reason, they backed off. Pacelli's presence was just too much for them. Yes. And they returned with no explanation to their to their communist commander why they didn't. But there was a very definite desire to to assassinate Pacelli at the time. Oh, yeah. Well, years later, uh, Pacelli gave that pectoral cross to Spellman in New York. And on one evening on the broadcast, Sheen wore the pectoral cross. They, the Spellman knew, of course, the effect that that would have on millions of viewers when Sheen had this. Yeah. Great story to have told. It is. Well, again, your books are available through EW10's Religious Catalog. You can go to religious, EW10ReligiousCatalog.com and you get DVDs as well from the shows. I want to thank you very much and ask you thank to join you. me in blessing everybody. Certainly, Father. And Almighty God bless you all and keep you, the Father, Father Son, Son, and Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. And remember, we can have Father Connor here and have him do these great new series that he's been doing all these years because this network is brought to you by you. You make it possible for him to do the work that he does here and make this good, solid Catholic television. So please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll be able to pay all of the bills, feed him, bring him here, take him out, and have a great time with him. God bless you all. <laughs>